In many countries and communities today, religion is believed to be irrelevant, even dangerous, and something to be feared. What people fail to grasp is that the values Western democracies are built on come from the teaching of Jesus. Values such as the equality of all people, education for everyone, humility and service in leadership. Um, I would say the world is completely different because of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. He's showing us what it means to be human. And there's people who are intrigued by this. They get woke up, they're dissatisfied, they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're restless. And they say, I think I will give him a try. I think I will try to do what he says. I wouldn't even know where to start. It, it changed everything for me. Um, and I hope it's still changing everything for me uh, every day because I'm not exactly finished. He brought the practice of and the message of the unconditional love of God. It is easy for us to love those who love us, but the true challenge is loving those who are not kind to us. This piece of dust, I'll live forever, because I'm linked up with God through what Jesus has done. Now for me, can I tell you, that's a total game changer because it gives me eternity. Western civilization would not exist had not there been Jesus. Because he took this unnamed, unwanted, abused, adopted chick that should have been a statistic um, and he was the game changer. He just turned my life around radically. This series is a journey through the United States, the UK, India, Singapore and Australia, talking with more than 30 academics, authors, researchers and modern day game changers about how the life and teaching of Jesus changed the world and why it matters. They were a relatively small group of people who sought to follow this Jesus of Nazareth. Why did the life and teaching of Jesus become such a game changer? Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you for the welcome. Just uh, to let you know what you just saw, and just in case you weren't sure, it's a 10-part DVD series. My son works in IT. When we were pressing the DVDs, he said, Dad, serious, does anybody still buy a DVD? Apparently they do, but if you can't find your DVD player and you can't remember the last time you saw it, uh, we, we can stream this as well off our website. There's a discussion guide, but again, if you're into apps, there's a free app for the discussion guide. Go to Google Play or iTunes. The, the discussion guide is completely as a free app. And the largest, largest evangelistic tract you've ever seen is this. Uh, it won't fit in your pocket, a bit hard to give out at train stations, but it's, it is actually the content of the series and a beautiful book that you can leave in your home or your workplace. All of this is designed to help people recognize and come to know the name of Jesus. That's what we're about. That's our motivation. I, I just want to jump off script just a little to say that it's very awkward when you're doing an uh, doing announcement. And the announcement is really significant. And the announcement is about yourself. And the fact that Jason has just been uh, uh, put up for reappointment for five, another five years is actually a remarkable moment in the life of this church. And I want you to join me in congratulating him in that. Probably that's the reason I'm here today, but I'm going to speak as well. But uh, he's, a, he's a great leader. He's doing a fabulous job. This church is a wonderful church. God is blessing what you guys are doing. And his role in that, along with all the other people, no, no reducing all the other team. But uh, congratulations, Jason. Looking forward to what's going to happen in the future. We are, we are sharing, I'm sharing this message about Jesus being the game changer uh, uh, across Australia and in different parts of the world because it's a very, very significant question. 
we've sang earlier that wonderful, wonderful song, won a Grammy, I think, which was about this idea that, that Jesus is the king, Jesus reigns, there's nobody greater than the name of Jesus. But what we tend to do is say that that's about us personally. Jesus is doing this for us personally. And we come into church and we celebrate it in our homes, in our small groups, in our life groups, in our ministries, we celebrate it. But it's almost like we feel like we need to do this personally because on the wider scale, there's a question about whether faith, religion and belief is actually a positive thing. There's actually a question out there about does, does religion have a positive impact on our, on our world? Is religion a force for good? Now we're in church on a Sunday morning and where your response to that question would be, of course religion is a force for good. How could you think that religion wasn't a force for good? Well, a couple of years ago, Ipsos polling, they, they do a lot of polling around the world. And whenever there's a, an election in Australia, you'll see stats from Ipsos polling. So they actually did a poll on that question. Is religion a force for good around the world? They did it with uh, in numbers of countries, 14,000 people. The outcome was about 50-50. And you're probably thinking, well, that's not so bad. Well, 50-50, that was because across Arabic nations, Arab nations, they voted 95% yes. So in, across places like uh, Australia, we were only 34% yes. Uh, a place like the UK, it was down to 25. The low point was Sweden at about 19%. Only one in five people think that what we hold to, what we believe in, what we, what we commit our lives to is actually a force for good. Now, you, you and I have all seen, you know... Um, news stories about where religion is, is actually seems to be a force for evil and we tend to in our minds say well this is we're, we're different from that we don't hold to that we hold a God of love a God as we've already talked about this morning a God that is good but in the wider community they don't make that distinction and so what we're dealing with is a community that wants to take faith and belief out of the public square because they think it's not a force for good uh, Paul Kelly, who writes for the Australian newspaper in, uh, uh, here in Australia, uh, he's an editor at large, and he basically wrote uh, in the middle of last year that what the left and the progressives want to do in the Australian community is take religion out of, take belief and faith out of the public square. This idea that it doesn't have a place in the public square, it's only for a personal life. And yet, even though there's this pressure, Jesus still is a remarkably influential person across the world. Now, not just in faith and church circles, across the world. There's a book called Who's Bigger? It's written by two computer scientists. Not the most dynamic personalities you'll ever meet. It kind of comes with the territory of computer scientists, all those computer scientists in the room. I apologize now. Uh, he, he, what they're trying to do is look at ma large data sets, metadata, large data sets, and say, okay, what does this large data set tell us about a particular question? So what Skiena and Ward wanted to do was to ask, okay, what is the la a large data set like Wikipedia, 500,000 people on Wikipedia, what does it tell us about who's the most influential person in human history? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, whatever you hold to. And they went through this whole process. They did this in 2000, and they released the book in 2016, so it's very recent. Uh, they, they are not people of faith and belief at all. They're just they're, they're university lecturers that work in a university setting, but they actually wanted to say, so what, what does this tell us? How do we work out who's the most influential person? Whose pages are read the most? Whose pages are changed the most? Whose pages are referred to the most? Whose pages are linked to other pages? How long are the pages, etc., etc., etc. And in the end, you won't be surprised to know that they come up with the top couple of thousand, top 100, top 10, and the most influential person in human history is Jesus of Nazareth. Now again, we're in church and we go, yes, of course he is. But it's kind of odd in a lot of ways. And one reason it's odd is think about what Jesus left. What did Jesus leave when he actually left? At the point of his death or his point of his resurrection or at the point of his ascension, what was left? What was here on earth when Jesus left? And you're thinking, well, the church. And, well, it, there wasn't much actually. He, he, didn't, he didn't write a book. He didn't own any assets. He didn't start a political party or movement. He, he didn't hold any position of power. 
He didn't start an organization. I mean, certainly the church started after him, but he didn't kind of organize to start the organization. He didn't have several campuses that you're looking at. Good on you, fantastic. He didn't do any of that. In fact, the gathering of his disciples after when, when this place of fear and concern about the future in Acts 1.15, there was 120 in the room. That's not exactly an astounding group of people. Who would have thought that 2,000 years later, anybody, anybody would have said that Jesus is the most influential person in human history? I mean, compare Jesus to Caesar Augustus, who was in charge of the world at that time, the Roman Empire that stretched from basically from what we would now know as Iraq all the way through to southern England. That whole area was ruled by essentially one man in charge of all of it. At the end of his life, he he had all of these troops put in roads so they could get the troops to any part of that empire as quickly as anybody could in that time enormously powerful, designed his own mausoleum, decided what was going to be on the outside of it. All of this before he died, no personal uh, esteem issues with our Caesar Augustus. But why do you know the name Caesar Augustus? Because of Luke chapter 2, at the time of Caesar Augustus, they decided to have a census. I mean, the interesting thing is, if that, at that point of time, if somebody had said, who, who are we going to talk about in 10 years or 20 years or 50 years or 100 years, Jesus of Nazareth or Caesar Augustus, who would have said Jesus? If you're not sure what the answer is, the answer is nobody. Nobody. Now, this is a really corny line, and I wish it were my line, but it's not my line. But somebody has said, in these days, we name our children after people like Peter and Mary, and Paul, and John, and we name our dogs Caesar and Nero. It's a kind of subtle way of saying the life and teaching of Jesus is the most influential person in human history. Jesus changed the world, and Jesus' influence continues today. Even though he didn't leave months, Jesus has lasting influence on our culture. There's so much of our culture that bears the imprint of the life and teaching of Jesus. And one of the things that within the church and within the community is that we've lost sight of that. It's a guy called uh, Ruislav Palakin who wrote a book called Jesus Through the Centuries. Very interesting book looking at these issues. And one of the things that Palakin said is if you were able to invent a magnet, I know this is a bit weird, just stay with me. If you were able to invent a huge magnet that you were able to hold over human history and every metal shard that had any relationship with Jesus could be dragged out of history by this, hu- this massive magnet. Any element in teaching, any element in music, any element in art, any element in, in values and culture, if all of that was dragged out of especially Western culture, what would be left? And the answer is not a lot. So much of Western democratic liberal nations as we know them today find their values in the life and teaching of Jesus. Around, depending on how you do your theology and your surveys and your numbers, are over two billion people now today follow the name of Jesus. Uh, the greatest, as it were, gathering of any religion around the world or faith-based group of people. Jesus remains enormously influential. And this series is helping us as Christians and people within the community, but to be reminded of that enormous influence. So what are the ways that Jesus is influenced? If you're thinking, well, that sounds great, and I'm in church, I'm really excited that you're saying this, but I can't actually think of too many ways that Jesus has been influential. We need to read a little more, and one of them is to ask this question about equality. I mean, we believe in equality. We believe that all people have equal dignity and worth. Equality within the Australian community has had a lot of discussion in the last couple of years. And Christians are seen as those who supposedly stand against equality, and that would be wrong. We actually believe that every individual, from the most broken, disabled child to the wealthiest billionaire in the world, actually have the same dignity and worth. Here's a little assignment, don't do it because it's not culturally appropriate. Walk, go through any crowd today in any shopping centre, stop, bump into strangers, stop them and ask them, do you believe that all people are equal? Do you believe all people have equal worth? And I think you'd be very surprised to find anybody that says, no, they're all unequal. 
Now, here's an aside, very important. Whether we live that out is another issue. And all of us understand that in particular places within our community, there isn't a sense of equality and some people have felt dismissed by the community. The fact that we can't live it out doesn't mean that we don't actually believe it. We stand for the sense that people are of equal dignity and worth. Where did that idea come from? I mean, the interesting thing is in, in the, uh, the American Declaration of Independence, which I know you don't really care about, but as a matter of interest, here's one of these great nations. And one of the things that they said in the American Indepe Declaration of Independence is that we hold these truths be self-evident that all men, they used that sexist language then, all people are created equal. Here, here are these people like Jefferson and, and Franklin and Adams gathering together to stand away from England as it were and one of the first things they want to state is a self-evident truth of the world or us as a nation if we become a nation is that all people are equal. Now you'll probably think, well, we've always thought that. Humanity has always thought that and across the world they do. Well, neither of those things are true. In Jesus' time, they didn't believe in equality. It wasn't an equal nation. In fact, some of the greats, the kind of um, Greek philosopher kings like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, they actually believed in natural inequality. They believed there was a slave class and that slave class was there to serve them. The, uh, Aristotle talked about slaves as living tools, something that you own. He referred to them as anthropodon, which is a Greek word that's neither male nor female. It's a kind of a neuter term, which says subhuman. Into that setting comes the person of Jesus, who talks and, and demonstrates and lives the equality of all people. He would serve the wealthy and he would touch the leper. He was there for the centurion and the woman with a 12-year bleed. He would put children in the midst of his disciples and say, you want to see what greatness looks like? There's greatness. He changed the game when it came to equality. And even if you think, well, yeah, but that was a long time ago. We've moved on from that. Well, not if you believe in a Hindu philosophy to life. I'm not suggesting that people, all people in India uh, are, are, are bad people or terrible people have awful values but I'm saying this if you believe in a Hindu philosophy of life you do not end in equality a Hindu philosophy of life basically holds for numbers of things but two major tenets is karma and reincarnation and reincarnation says you don't actually die that just you just come back as something else if you've done a great life, you'll come back higher. If you've done less, a, a bad life, in their terms, if you haven't lived a good life, you'll come back less down, down the, basically in the, the list of sectors within the community. And, and there are five castes, and the highest caste is the Brahma's caste. Now think about this. If you believe in karma, which says your next life is generated out of how you lived your last life, if you come back as a Bra if you're a Brahman caste, what do you think about your position? Well, you have a total sense of entitlement. I'm not sure what I did in the last life, but boy, it must have been good because look where I am. And I'm not sure what they did, the Dalits or those below, but they must have lived a very good life because look where they sit. And in some ways, I'm not saying that all Indian people live this out, but in some ways, at it pushed to its extremes, that says, I don't need to help those people because they have to live out their karma for their next life. We showed the snake charmers at the beginning of the trailer. Do you see the snake charmers at the beginning of the trailer? We put that there for two reasons. First, it's a very cool piece of footage. But secondly, because that represents the inequality of a nation where those people are not the Dalit class, which is the lowest class. They are below that class. They, they have less value than animals within that culture. They have no birth certificates, no rights, no place. They're not actually people. That, those people are, are snake charmers because that's the only work they can get. They have a village where the, a group called Empart, run by Jossie Chucker, who's on our, our, our video. He's a guy that comes from Melbourne, but now lives in India. Uh, sorry, has a ministry that works in India, lives in Melbourne. And they started a school for these kids to give them an opportunity. The local community has tried to shut down that school violently on a number of occasions. You know why? Because they don't want their slaves to get a role and go away and leave them. 
In that setting, Jesus comes in and changes the game. And Jesus comes in and says, all people are equal. What about care? What about the way we care for people? We have all sorts of arguments about care in Australia. The arguments about who should pay, how much they should pay, how they should deliver that care. Nobody says we shouldn't care. Nobody in Australia says, well, just let them rot. We Some do, but very few say that. There's a sense that we should care. It is our responsibility to care. And it's people who are Christians and people who are atheists who all care. But where did the value of care come from? Again, we kind of think, well, haven't people always thought that? Well, in the Greco-Roman world of Jesus' time, there was a sense that you didn't care for people. There's a, an Australian um, uh, ancient historian whose name's Edward Judge, comes out of uh, Macquarie University in Sydney, has written a piece that basically says at that time, it, it, was, it was actually seen as a negative trait to care for people. You, you didn't care. That was their lot in life. You got on with your life and they did their job. Into that setting comes Jesus who demonstrates a mode of care. I want to get back to how Jesus said that, but to make this point, there's a guy whose name's Tom Holland. And Tom Holland, uh, is a, as a writer, has worked for the BBC as well in, in the UK. Uh, Tom Holland uh, is an expert in the Greco-Roman world. He's, a, he's passionate about Rome. He's written about it and about that whole area of life. And Holland released an article, just a couple of pages, you can look it up online last year, this is just a a photocopy of it, and Tom Holland was basically, wrote this article, and the article was written about him, which was, why I changed my mind on Christianity. Now Holland is not, I don't think in this article he's saying, I'm now a Christian. What he's saying is, I've changed my mind about Christianity. And and while looking at Greco-Roman world for a long time, he wrote this, it wasn't just the extremes of callousness I find shocking, but the lack of a sense that the poor or weak might have any intrinsic value. Here is a historian from an academic worldview looking at the Greco-Roman world and saying, they just didn't care. They seriously did not care. I mean, we love movies like Gladiator, don't we? You know, well, anyway, so some people admit we like Gladiator as a movie. But here's the deal. Think about that mode. There is a class of several thousand people whose only job was to go into an arena and fight somebody else to the death for the entertainment of the masses. I don't mean... It was a gruesome movie. This was actually kill people. And nobody in the arena said, is this a good idea? Should we be doing this? That was the culture. And what what Tom Holland goes on to realize is when you consider human history and why we care for people in human history, it is actually the teaching in the life of Jesus the early church and those that followed it that actually gave us a value of care, a foundational value that we should care. Here's what Tom Holland says. Even today, as belief in God fades across the West, the countries that were once collectively known as Christendom continue to bear the stamp of this two millennia old revolution that Christianity resents. Uh, represents. He says this, in my morals and ethics, I have learned to accept that I'm no longer, I'm not Greek or Roman at all, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. Now, I don't think he's saying, therefore, I'm a Christian. He may have got to that point. I don't know. But I'll tell you what he's saying is that the values that says I should care for people are not something that humanity or humanists thought of. It was a value given to us by Jesus. And even though many people across our community with an atheistic worldview will care for people and have their hearts broken for people, where that value came from was not their humanistic background. It was the life and teaching of Jesus. There's one, and there's so much more we can say about this, which I won't. But one of the dangers in looking at this material is to think, right, Isn't that wonderful? Jesus made all these changes to our values. The the, the world in which we live has been influenced by Jesus' values. And what Jesus did was to come and bring major sociological change across the the community of places like Australia. And that major sociological change is how Jesus is the game changer. And here's here's a hint. That would be wrong. 
Jesus did not come to bring major sociological change. Jesus came to change one person at a time, one life at a time, one heart at a time. And those people went on to change the world. Think about William Wilberforce. You probably know that name. Abolition of slavery in 1807, where the trading of slaves was abolished. And then in 1833, the British Parliament abolished slavery, and he died three days later. Remarkable, remarkable man. What you probably don't know is a bit of William Wilberforce's background. He grew up in outside of London, in kind of the Midlands of the UK. He, his dad died when he, was, when he was nine. He went to Cambridge University, was a, a, not a particularly brilliant scholar, was more, more of a party boy, but seemed to do well with people. At the age of 21, he became the member of Hull in England. And he went to Westminster as the member for Hull to the British Houses of Parliament. And there he was an instant hit, just 21 years old. Gets invited to all these private clubs. His best mate was William Pitt. And William Pitt, who went on to be the Prime Minister, his dad was the Prime Minister. So here he is, the heart of London, the heart of the, of the British community. He's in with all the right people. Then he goes on holidays on a grand tour. He goes with his uh, couple of aunties, I think his sister, his mum, but he also had a guy called Isaac Milner. And he and Isaac Milner and this family kind of toured around France and, uh, and parts of Europe. Now think about this. We're in, this. we're in the 19th century. You're touring. How do you tour France? Well, in a horse and carriage. And what do you do in a horse and carriage? Well, you don't have a phone, you don't have a tablet, you don't have a computer. You basically have to talk to people. It's a worrying thought, isn't it, really? All that time talking to people. And, and William Wilberforce and Isaac Milner, who was a brilliant scholar, basically discussed a book about faith, belief, and religion. And over these number of weeks, between the conversation between William Wilberforce and Isaac Milner, Wilberforce becomes a Christian. And he goes back to London back to the Houses of Parliament as a follower of Jesus. And you're thinking, well, he's excited now, isn't he? He's, he's got Jesus in his life. He's got all that influence. How wonderful. He was actually totally depressed. You know why he was depressed? Because he thought he'd wasted his life, wasted his education, wasted his time in Parliament. Maybe what I should do is what John Newton has done and become a, 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 an Anglican priest, an Anglican minister within the churches of England, and that, that would be what God wants me to do. What does God want me to do? And he's really depressed about his his position and depressed about his future. So he goes to see John Newton. John Newton was a, was a slave trader. He headed up slave ships. He then become an Anglican minister. He wrote the book, the book, he wrote the song Amazing Grace, the original one, not the one with the new cool verse. And uh, so he wrote Amazing Grace as the hymn and, John, and, and Wilberforce goes to see John Newton and he says to Wilton Newton, what should I do? Should I give up? And Newton says, you know, God has placed you in this time for this, this moment, this is your moment. And you know what, Wilberforce left with two great visions in his life. One with the abolition of slavery and two the reformation of manners, the reformation of the morals of England. And he gave himself to those two great goals for the rest of his life. William Wilberforce changed the game in English society and the world. Not because of sociological ideas that he followed, but because Jesus changed the game in his life. And the great truth that each of us need to grasp out of, these, out of what I'm trying to communicate this morning is that Jesus changes the game for you. Jesus wants to change the game for you. That's the message of Jesus. It's not the message of Jesus comes to make sociological change so our society is better. That happens. But it happens one person at a time, one individual at a time, one heart at a time. And you know what? Today might be your moment. Today, Jesus wants to change the game for you. He wants to come into your heart and your life and change your future. And who knows? Who knows what you might go on to do? But it starts with you. Do you want the game changed? You're in a place where you've put prayer notes on the wall 
or you haven't even got around to do that because you're so new and you don't understand any of this, but you know something has to change. People often come to church because things are desperate. Things are difficult, things are hard, and they're not sure what their future holds. And in that moment, Jesus comes in and says, I want to change the game for you. Some of you are actually enormously successful at what you do, and you recognize that that success is not actually delivering what you thought it would. And Jesus says, I want to change the game for you. I want to come into your heart and your life. You know how Jesus does that? His death and his resurrection demonstrates that he broke sin, he broke death, and he gives every one of us the opportunity to know God now and eternally, and that changes the game. Sometimes we think that we're kind of called to come into church and to play church and to play the game of church. That's not true. Jesus wants to say to come in here, I want to change the game in your life. I want you to be a new person. I want you to accept what I've done on the cross for you personally. I want to change the game in your life. Is this your moment? Is God speaking to you today? Is this the time that you think, I really need the game changed? I'm sick of the way I've lived. I'm sick of the outcomes. I'm tired of playing the game. I'm sick of being shallow. I want to be a new person. It might be like Will before us. You feel like you've wasted your life and you want a second chance at life. Well, you know what this is? Your moment. Jesus is not saying to you, come in here, be a better person. Jesus says, I want to accept you just as you are right now. I'm not going to leave you there. I'm going to change your heart and change your life. And I'm going to call you to be a game changer in the world in which we live. Is this for you? Because you know, I reckon the greatest loss out of this morning was if God's speaking to you and in some way you didn't respond and you missed this opportunity to have the game changed in your life. Is God speaking to you? I want to give you the opportunity to pray and to pray not out loud but in your own heart and to your heavenly father and in this moment I want you to take this chance that God has given you to have the game changed is this your moment you would have done this before you've come to church if you haven't I want you to be in an attitude of prayer just bow your heads and close your eyes it doesn't make actually this moment any more spiritual it just means that you can focus a bit more you can actually put aside the people that are around you and focus on this moment. Is God speaking to you? You know, it might actually be helpful for you to indicate to me that you think this is your moment, that God is speaking to you. And if that's the case, why don't you just look up at me and put up your hand. Just demonstrate to me, this is your moment. You want to pray this prayer. You need the game changed for you. Is this for you? Why don't you indicate to me right now that this is your moment and God is speaking to you. Just raise your hand. I'm going to pray with you and pray for you. Is God speaking to you? Is this your chance? Thank you. Other people, just look up. Raise your hand. This is the moment that God wants to speak to you. Thank you. That's fabulous. The moment the game will be changed. Why don't you pray with me? If this is your chance... This is your prayer. Don't say this out aloud. Speak to your heavenly Father. Why don't you follow these words with me? Lord Jesus, I give my life to you today. I'm sorry for how I've lived. And I'm sorry for ignoring you. I want a fresh start. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Fill me with your spirit and give me the opportunity to live what I say I believe. Lord Jesus, we thank you for those who have indicated that they've prayed today and those who have quietly prayed and responded to you. I pray your blessing into their heart. I pray your spirit into their life. I pray that you'd empower, renew and rebuild them. And I pray for all of us that this would not be an intellectual exercise. This would not be a moment of playing church. This would be a moment that our lives are changed. And we pray that we be the game changers that you call us to be in this world. 
Amén.